right. Hello, hello, everyone. Uh, it is good to have you with us. Uh, this is uh, this is kind of a fun, a fun little of a little stream. We like to do these during our crowdfunding campaigns. Um, uh, we are just going to be talking a little bit about the, the design, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have, and then I'll take you back and do a little bit of process stuff. So I mean, it feels so weird, so lonely, uh, <laughs> being on a stream by myself. Uh, so hi, everyone. I'm Cole. Uh, I am one of the uh, co-designers uh, of Molly House and um, co-owner of Whirligig with my brother. And uh, yeah, this is the uh, chill design stream celebrating day two of the campaign. We're in the come down now. We've got a lot of the a lot of the hard work has been done. We have a lot to uh, a lot to look forward to ahead. You know, there's this funny thing about uh, crowdfunding campaigns where the uh, weeks before campaign launches are exhausting, intense. There's um, basically it's all hands on deck. Um, it, there's never enough time to do all the work that you want to do, and then the campaign starts, and there's this sort of pause. The day one is very busy. Day two tends to be pretty busy. And then things sort of slowly start, start to settle back into their, their rhythm. Um, and then after that, um, the work then begins to, to ramp up again. So like our, the, the busiest days I feel like on my schedule when it comes to worthy gig things are right before a campaign launches and then sort of right after a campaign launches. Usually what we'll do after a, cam uh, sorry, after a campaign completes. Usually what we'll do after uh, the campaign is done is we will say, have a, a week or two of, of kind of respite and then once that's done we're, we're back at it and and we take a look at how long we have to finish the game and try to see what we need to do to actually get it to all of you uh hello north abbott hi izzy monkey howdy from uh minneapolis L love to have you up in minnesota um so a uh, great question from north abbott right at the start which is what is the weight of molly house which is a great question uh i'm actually going to answer this question by uh let me let me look at something really fast here. Um, so we actually had, when I was uh, at work the other day, um, w one of the people I worked with was working on a game, and they asked about the weight of their game. And they said, hey, everybody, guess the weight of the game I'm working on. And weight is one of those funny metrics. So this is a reference to the, the BGG weight system, uh, where players can kind of vote on what they think... Uh, how difficult a title is to learn, I guess. It's a funny, it's a funny thing because really it's, a, it's collapsing two very different things, uh, depth and tactical, especially tactical depth, uh, sorry, tactical and strategic depth, and difficulty to learn. Those are really two like super different things. Like for example, I'm gonna, I'll slam Warhammer here for a second. Warhammer I think is um, very difficult to learn. There are lots of rules, uh, but I don't think it's that deep. I think that uh, there are games with, you know, a third as many rules that are twice as deep or something. Uh, but let me, let me, in answering that question, I just want to look at this little chart I made. Oh my gosh, where is it? There it is. Um, and so uh, for context, so here's context. I, um, I think that Molly House is probably about a 2.8 <laughs> or 2.7. And here, here are the numbers I'm looking at. Heat is a 2.2. Cosmic Encounter is a 2.6. That seems low for me, but BGG has spoken. Uh, Taurus, 2.9. Ahoy, 2.9. Hansa, 3.1. Princes of Florence, 3.2. Maybe it's closer to the low three. It might be closer to three. Uh, Root is a 3.7. I think, I think, I think John Company is like a 4.5 or something. I think uh, I would guess that Molly House is going to sit between 2.9, 2.8, and something like three or three point one or two, so just something like that. Um, and then uh, someone asked, "What uh, what games have a similar style of, or feel?" That is a great question. I think you know essentially uh, one way of if I were to be very like uh, I don't know simplistic about Molly House, which I don't really want to be simplistic about Molly House, I would say that fundamentally it's a kind of push your luck game plus a hidden role game. So like one part werewolf and one part can't stop. Boy, that's a gross way to boil this game down. But that, that's one way of thinking about it. Um, and, and, but, but I do think about fundamentally it's a game like Ink and Gold or something that is fundamentally kind of a push your luck game. Uh, on the other hand, there is a, uh, a social component to it, a hidden role component. So that's another part of the design. And then actually the third component of the design is it's a game with, with a misery victory condition, which is to say a, a secondary 
alternate victory condition. And that way, it's a lot. It's quite similar to a lot of games I've I've worked on before. Um, uh, Valentin is that's a very good point. Uh, often a better metric is how, how much to think about how much upkeep you need to do each turn. How many actions can you take? Does a turn order matter? It's interesting using that metric to talk about games because I, I think about a game like the Mask Trilogy, like Tikal, which has a lot of action points. I think you get nine or something, and then you have a little menu of the the, the costs on those on those actions. And it can be even though the actions them, in themselves in games like Tikal and um, Mexico and games like that, the actions themselves are pretty simple. Their arrangement and the technical possi possibilities of a turn are pretty dramatic. You know, in terms of the actual rules complexity, I mean, I'll share the rules with you right now, actually. Um, so I have this document. I, I mentioned it, I think, yesterday. This is a, a printed set of, of rules. And actually, you know what I do when I work on these rules? I always start by just opening up one of our previous rule books, and then I just copy and paste the styles over, making adjustments to fonts and things like that. Um, but these rules are a little shorter than the Pamir rules. Um, and the actual spreads are pretty generous. So we're using a larger typeface than we use on other games. Uh, we've got lots of room for big art pieces. You know, here's the, the general rules section, uh, how the vice cards work, things like that. And I'll, I'll be showing actually more of this document um, pretty, pretty soon, I think. Um, yeah, I, so I don't know. I mean, I think w when it comes to explaining the rules, the way that I've, I've started talking about Molly House is saying that 90% um, of the actions that you take are extremely simple. Uh, can be explained in a few seconds, really not more complex than anything you do in heat. And then there's one action, the running of parties, that is fairly complex. It, it's really like a small game within the game. Um, do, 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 do. The, uh, you know, so somebody asked about uh, games that have similar style and feel. One game that has been coming up a lot in the conversation, which is funny, because I don't think Joe and I and Drew have ever really talked about this game, at least together. Drew and I have talked about it uh, by ourselves, is uh, the game Unfathomable, which is itself kind of a, a light remixing of Battlestar Galactica. And I do actually think Molly House is kind of in that genre. Uh, it's weird because I don't... Uh, BSG is one of those games that I like to think about, and I have enjoyed sometimes. And I think sometimes it can be very good, but I think as a piece of design, it doesn't really hold together. And Unfathomable kind of bummed me out because, to me, uh, BSG has, a, has some fundamental mechanical problems uh, that you just deal with, you just stomach, because the, 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 the experience is sometimes greater than the sum of the, its parts. But uh, Unfathomable, which is, a, I think, a better game in many regards, uh, to me, like, weirdly doubled down on the narrative component and not, didn't, like, really tangle with some of the, the mechanical issues. And so I, I, I always feel, I feel weird about Unfathomable because I've played it a lot and, and I do enjoy it, but... I want a lot more out of those types of games, and I think that's one reason why I kept finding myself feeling very animated to work on to work on Molly House. Um, do 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 do. Okay, just I'm going to try to keep up on these comments. Um, yeah, and I'm, I'm really I'm always happy to hear uh, wild John Company stories. I mean, the thing I think that I love about John Company is how different the game can be, and Molly House has that difference. It every player count in in, the, in Molly House feels very different than the other player counts. Uh, and, and that even is, 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 can be a little bit of a detriment. It's something that we're kind of working on in development. But Molly House also can feel very different if the players are playing uh, informers. If everyone's an informer, the game will still work, but it will work in a weird way. And if no one is an informant, the game still works. I mean, imagine sitting down and playing a game of Mafia or Werewolf where there was no traitor. Now, because players can assume there's a traitor, um, it can still create pretty interesting games. But there's, um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to give the game a kind of weird feel. And I think, you know, I, my favorite game in this genre, which I've mentioned many times publicly, is Blood on the Clock Tower, which I think is fabulous. And it does a lot of really cool work. Um, okay. So here's what I want to do with this stream. So I can, as I'm sure you all know, I can prattle on about games really without, without end. Uh, but I, what I wanted to do is spend a little time kind of talking to you all. Um, 
talking a little about the campaign, about what we have going on, and then I'm just going to kind of share stuff, and, and, and maybe we, I might actually do a little bit of work together. It can be like one of those COVID-era work streams, hopefully not quite so dreary, um, but I'm just going to kind of show you the things that we're working on, and uh, I'll, I'll show you our messy, messy, messy file structure, which usually I've actually, I've gotten a lot better with my file structure. I'm pretty, I make pretty clean files, it, with the sole exception of the Molly House files, which are the messiest files I've ever worked on. And I think there are reasons for that, but I'm very excited for like December 1st, I'm gonna boot up my computer and just rebuild all the files from scratch and they're gonna be beautiful. Um, okay, so let's, let's get into it. So actually I wanted to start with, um, I, so you know, here we are, at backer kit, hooray. Uh, th this campaign has gone really, really well. We've been very happy with it. Um, it's, it's 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 just remarkable, and it does a lot of um, it 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 has uh, it has meant a, a lot to everyone on the team that the campaign has done as well as it's done, and we're really excited about the coming weeks for how the campaign's going to go. Um, Y'all have shown us that we can spend a lot of time making a game like this, and so that is very validating. Um, so on Backerkit, we one thing that is different from Kickstarter is, and I'm sure many of you have seen this we have this really robust, uh, essentially, forum that we can put polls up and we can do all kinds of things in, and we're really just using a very small fraction of, it, of its features. But I was able to start a thread this morning and ask for questions about the game. Um, and I just think that that's, it, it's wonderful, and I'm so happy that we're able to do that because, look, uh, the problem with, with Kickstarter is we could tell people, hey, go to the comments, but... It, to answer a particular question, but we know that people will be answering that question alongside someone asking us about a shipping, uh, you know, cost to Armenia or something. And it's just nice to have a, a little bit more focus in the comment section. And we have found the discussions so ge so generous. I've just been really um, moved by how good the comments have been. It's been really fun to spend some time there in the evenings and just uh, answering you guys' requests. So, um, ah, these are, and there are some really good questions here. So, um, do, 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 do. Someone asks, uh, a, uh, so Jay asked th th this question about, uh, you know, they're very, very happy and impressed with the interweaving of the mechanics and the theme. Thank you. Uh, we are too. Um, but notice that the Mollies all have the same image. Quite right. Quite right, Jay. The Mollies right now all have the same image. It is a piece of line work for uh, an image of uh, Princess Serafina. Now, what I want to share with you, all, I'm going to go uh, pull it up here in just a second is, let's see here. Uh, okay, I'm gonna see if th 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 this might be unfortunately difficult to find, but we're gonna see. Um, we're gonna see how I figure it out. Okay, excellent. So um, when we were originally working on the tarot illustrations, I'm gonna, uh, I'll share some things. I have, I have the power to just show you guys what I'm looking at, which I'm excited about. Uh, let me bring up, I got to get all these files in their proper order though. Um, one fu fun, fun bit of trivia, uh, whenever I'm going through these files, uh, I, I use a, I use Dropbox for a lot of our, a lot of our company files and, uh, the Dropbox grew out of an account I had when I was a graduate student. And so every game I've ever worked on, its files are housed within graduate school, like graduate writings, games. <laughs> and then all the files are sitting in there, even though that's like where all the all the, the memory uh, is, is certainly allocated these days. So when we were working on Molly House, originally we had this notion of uh, the Mollies as having kind of relationship charts. Let me see if I can find an image that shows that really cleanly. Yes, here's one. This will work out just fine. Uh, th this is actually from a uh, aborted version uh, that did not work at all. Um, so you can see this here. Uh, so here we have a, a spread for one of our digital tabletops. And these relationship charts here, the way they worked is you had to enter where the little hands were. And then you had, you had a little relationship trip uh, marker, a relationship status marker that would advance. And then this little pink crown is the, the heart of the molly. So at the end of the uh, week, whoever was closest to Princess Serafina's heart would get these points. So originally you had these resources that you would spend. And so we, I use this kind of dumb militaristic language for like fortifying and pushing. You could like push the pawns around. There's a little mini game here. And none of this stuff is important. But what is important is the way this piece of art works. 
because we actually had these relationship charts for a really long time. And so when I was first talking to Rachel about the art, I said, the mollies are going to be in these really big pieces of punch board. They'll be bigger than a tarot card or around the same side of, uh, size of a tarot card, which is longer and only a little bit wider than a standard uh, poker card. And we want the art to focus on the face and then kind of like blend down into the gown. Uh, and then the gown, we, we, we would have a UI element on top of the gown, as you can see here. Uh, so what we did then, let me uh, find some of Rachel's excellent work. I don't know how easy this is going to be. So then uh, Rachel, after a lot of back and forth, uh, gave us this, this Molly. This is Princess Serafina. And then did a colored version here, uh, which you can see, which I'll make larger and nicer like that. There we are. Uh, and the idea was the UI would be sitting, would be sitting down here. Um, and we, we loved this image. I mean, obviously, we, we put it all over the place. Uh, but, uh, and, and Rachel, to work on this image, we had a really lovely conversation uh, with them. And they uh, worked from notes that Joe had written. And uh, no, uh, Joe wrote this document, thank you, um, that basically offered uh, little bios of the Mollies and reference photos. Right, so here's here's uh, Pretty Chris, this this soldier, uh, and just some like you know somewhat period pieces, a little bit of wandering here. Um, there's uh, Julius Caesar Taylor, um, and the idea was these were just kind of touchstones, and so we said you know Rachel choose any that you might want, and then you can kind of do your do your own your own image. Um, now what what happened is. Uh, as we were, as this image was being completed, so as we were like going through these, these drawings, the design changed. And we said, oh, actually we want the mollies, they're actually gonna be poker cards. And so like this image is not really the right aspect ratio for the way we're using it. Uh, and so even though we had the finely done, very pretty image, it, I didn't feel right using it on the poker cards. So we're using just this, this placeholder right now, uh, th this line art. Um, but to, to answer the question directly that, that Jay sent uh, earlier, uh, we're going to have unique illustrations for every Molly that will be drawing from the notes that Joe has prepared. Uh, and I think it's really going to present kind of a, a universe, uh, which I'm really, I'm really excited about. Um, okay, cool. So that, that is an answer to question one, my goodness. Um, and let me look at some of the other ones that we wanted to bring up. Uh, so this... Um, uh, this is a really interesting question from Arnaud. Uh, the game doesn't uh, seem to lean on traditional French suits, hearts, diamonds, clovers, spades, but instead uses coins, hearts, fans, and cups. So coins and cups are, of course, from other card traditions, but never have seen fa I've never seen fans in that tradition. So this is a really interesting point of conversation. Um, and I will just say uh, just a, a few, few words about it. So we had originally planned on building the deck around the tarot, the original tarot deck, or sorry, I think the original plan was we would come up with our totally our own suits. And then we came up with suits that were riffing on the tarot. And then as we played the game, there was a version of the game that existed for a while where half the suits were red and half of them were black. And so we found ourselves leaning more into the poker tradition. And then when we moved to the current system for the game, we found ourselves, um, moving back into quasi tarot territory. And what we started realizing, so all, you know, the evolution of cards is, um, oh my gosh, there's just so much to talk about when it comes to like card, card design. Um, the evolution of card suits and decks of cards is one of the most documented elements of the history of print culture. If you spend some time online, you can find just immeasurable archives with just amazing, amazing historical uh, card art. And uh, this is a tradition that is constantly borrowing it from itself and from adjacent traditions. And so we decided kind of early on that like we actually wanted something like a hybrid approach. And we decided that we wanted to have the suits work thematically, metaphorically. Um, we wanted, sorry, we wanted the suits to have a metaphorical resonance that would allow us to make them um, tell stories uh, just through their play. So one thing, and, and, and this is something that I don't know if we're actually going to have time to like fully correct it before we release the, the print and play, but it's something that, that we might be able to do, is uh, I will show you. Um, if you look at the deck in the game, here's the, here's the deck file. 
uh, we have these uh, little bits of, uh, of text, this, this flavor text. And some of this flavor text is drawn from historic, oops, sorry, I'm not even sharing my screen. Let me fix that. Uh, so here's the, here are all the cards in the game right now. So we have, all the cards have little flavor text, right? A suit of red damask, fine curtsies. Um, and they, they have an escalation. So like the low cards are more moderate, smaller behaviors, gestures. And then the higher cards are much higher, more elaborate desires. And we group these desires into kind of like four thematic camps. And then we sort of associated them with these different suits. Now, right now, the associations are kind of all scrambled up. And uh, Joe, uh, I know, wants to go through and kind of rearrange things. There's also uh, an interesting conversation we had about like, you know, for instance, we have quotes on the cup suits, the idea of like cups being effusive, sharing, um, you know, we have these quotes on here. Is two lines of text enough? I kind of would love if we could get the, the, the thematic text, what we might call flavor text, to just two lines, you know, and perhaps, what is this, like 10 words maybe or 12. Um, that would be really great. But we, we will see. Uh, but to Arno's question, we are borrowing from like a lot of different card traditions here. Um, and also, you know, our use of poker cards is interesting. Um, the game Brag, which is a uh, predecessor of poker, um, is actually derives from, from this period. And so, you know, a lot of the games being played would have been kind of trick takers or pr kind of pro trick takers. And then of course, um, these proto poker, poker games. Um, and so the, uh, you know, the various, the various card traditions, uh, here are hinting at the, the, the poker traditions that are going to come after. Um, okay. Excellent. So there's, there's that. Uh, let me go here. Uh, all right, let's see here. I'm going to try to take a look, um, making sure to stay on, stay on top of, yes. And actually, you know, what, one reason that we decided to um, uh, offer the commission to Rachel among, we had really several excellent applicants for our artist position. Um, the reason why Rachel got it is because their work displayed a deep familiarity with these card traditions and thinking about using a, an object of play to tell a story and to do it in a way that was historically sensitive, uh, it was very clear that they were the right, the right person for, for the job. Um, so, you know, it, it's always a hard choice because we had a, we, our last few candidates were really, really good, but um, just the sense of the ludic was the thing that kind of pushed us over. Uh, okay, and then um, someone... Um, wanted uh, to, to ask us uh, have, uh, if we could give them a feel of how the game would look when it was all produced. So here, I, you know what I'll do? I'll share my favorite thing in the world. Um, I will share the Kickstarter page for uh, PAX Premier. So, you know, it, I, uh, I'm a simple person. I, I'm not good at 3D. I, we all do our best with what we've got, but I am better as a uh, product designer than a project sharer, let's say. Um, when we first went to crowdfunding with Pamir back aeons ago, but before Root had really even come out, this, was, uh, this, this went, went live basically right before Root came out. Um, this is kind of what, I mean, I made this thing. I can't remember where I got this silly brush font. Um, but we didn't really know how this was going to look. In fact, I've got some like weird versions of Pamir that I could share with people of like alternate covers that we had done. Um, but this is the image I wanted to share. Uh, this is a very bad 3D image that says even in very close type note, 3D product renders are not my strong suit and I can hardly do justice to what the final game will look like. And really I just, just say, look, I would, I'm trying to raise money for this thing so we can make it and it can match the vision. And if you want to help that process, great. And if you don't, and you want to see it when it's all done, that's also fine. Um, but at this point, we had like wanted this, um, this like blue board, uh, which I will, you know, I know that this, this isn't a, a chat about Pamir at all. Um, and I, I certainly don't want to be derailings, but like we actually made a blue board. I don't know if I've ever shared this, this next image, but I'm, I'm going to, because it's kind of, it's kind of fun. Um, I, uh, and I, and actually I just found some pictures of it the other day. Uh, let me see if I can't, if I can quickly locate this. If I can't, we're not going to worry about it. 
Um, so when we were working on Pamir, I bought a piece of denim. Here we go. Um, get over here. I bought a piece of denim and uh, we used a, a child's like stop pedestrian crosswalking sign from some playset to uh, make the scoring track. And then we used gold paint on this old piece of denim. And then, um, you know, that, that's what it looked like. This is actually, uh, the, the, I knew the size of the pieces. Uh, and so I had, I had, uh, I knew that the, the pieces in Premiere are basically like two stacked pieces of dice. I just glued them together and then, uh, my partner spray painted them while I was at work as like a birthday surprise one day. Um, but we were able to do this to kind of like get a sense of the materiality. And once we had this on the table, we were like, oh yeah, we probably don't want like a blue or like a dark looking mat. Like it's kind of neat, but it has other problems. But actually one reason why the pieces were originally pastel was because we wanted a very dark, a very dark board for Premiere. Um, so, you know, I, I look at something like this and then the Molly House campaign, uh, you know, I think f for one looks way nicer than anything that we did that, that, that we did back then. Uh, but there are lots of things that aren't yet done. So, you know, the map for Molly House, for instance, is it's just a, it, it's a playtesting map. Uh, it, it's not it's not something that has gotten a lot of attention yet. I mean, mostly uh, one funny thing about doing playtesting, so here's, here's the map, is the primary role of this object is to make it so a playtester can understand how to play the game. And so I'm not, you know, trying to make this that pretty. I want it to be a little pretty. I, you know, look at, these, look at these fun painterly strokes I stuck on that. <coughs> this is a very famous map of London that you'll see used occasionally that was done in 1740. It's like, I think it, the only reason it gets used is because it's very easy to get online in high resolution. And it's such a giant object that you can do a lot of fun things with it as a texture, as I did here. Um, for instance, this was a very bad bag icon that I made that's supposed to be like a knotted bag, I guess. I don't know. It, it kind of looks like a, a dress or something. Um, here's an ear that I, I don't know stole from somewhere probably it's just a play testing it's just a placeholder um it was you know what i usually do is I'll, I'll look through old books and i'll find like an engraving of an ear and i'm like cool and i'll screen capture it and trace it do a live trace whatever i'll do something that's just going to give it to me to use it as a play testing hold um and uh but you know th this is a very famous piece of an important broad broadsheet the woman haters lament that we wanted to put in the title card um yeah, but, uh, you know, th this board is not something that we've, like, really worked on. Uh, we're not even sure yet if it's going to be a six-panel board or a four-panel board. And then, you know, we had thought, for instance, for these areas to have kind of like Hogarthian um, illustrations. It's also possible that we make a much more literal map where this is like, it looks a little bit like um, the map in old editions of Scotland Yard where it's kind of like at a distance and you kind of like see like a living map of London. Uh, the map will, can be, might, might, might be quite colorful. There's like a lot, we have a lot of different choices for how we want to do this map. And I just want to wait and see how the game develops a little bit more because this general layout has been doing a good job outside of the horrible thing that's happening here. Look at this long path, that's not good. I always, I always look when I'm looking at these maps, what, one, one thing, this is like a, someone who's been around the block when it comes to game design. I'm always interested in how hard it is to gauge uh, distance. So for example, like this spot, the Thief Taker's office and the Castle Yard, well, it's like one, two, three, or is it one, two, three? But like that seems like it should be longer, like as, as, you, as you track these distances, because the way the map is stretched out, it's not letting your eye naturally see the true distances. This can be fixed by putting things on a grid. There's like a ton of ways to fix it. Uh, nobody needs to do a fan redraw this map right now, I promise you. Uh, but the main thing is that we're going to, um, we're going to make this map look really beautiful. It's going to probably include a lot of hand-drawn art. Um, you know, as the campaign is doing well, we don't have any things like stretch goals or things like that. Um, but internally, we have a lot of stretch goals. So as the campaign does better, I'm like, okay, cool. We can get Rachel to do a remarkable looking map and really lean into it. But I don't even want to start that process until one, we have seen how the campaign does, and two, um, we have finished the blocking for what the actual game demands out of it. Um, Izzy, we are also super excited to see what Ricky's doing with the uh, solo stuff. Uh, in fact, Drew just shared with me the first draft of Ricky's solo notes. Like it is, I think it's a sort of like working framework for a solo design. Um, 
it's it's looking really cool. It's it's really neat, and I I think that there's a, there's a pretty good chance that we'll have more to share on that before the end of the campaign. But I, we always want to be careful because we want to give we don't want Ricky to feel like he's trapped in doing what his like kind of fir- best first pass was. Uh, but if he wants to share his, uh, his 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 work, he's certainly welcome to. Um, excellent. Yeah, that. Um, uh, and I will say uh, I cannot pronounce the Zuthuku. Lee says uh, that they, they remind a little bit of Mantis Falls, a game I like quite a bit. I think Mantis Falls is really neat, uh, very, very well done. Um, okay, so, uh, all right, so that's, that's that stuff I wanted to share. Now, the other, the other uh, set of questions that I saw, and this is actually, am I cheating a little bit by doing this? Maybe. Um, the other set of questions that I saw that I thought was really cool was from a BGG thread. And this person on this BGG thread uh, this is from Canadian guy one. Uh, they have a thread called Hope, Hopes for the Game, which I was like, what a great, what a lovely, um, what a w- wonderful and constructive way of thinking about what it is to do these games in the kind of way that we do them. Like to say, look, I'm not going to say, I'm not going to be mad about something. I'm just going to say, this is, this is what, when I look at a project, this is what I hope they're kind of able to accomplish, which I'll say from a backer perspective, just as a backer, Whenever I'm looking at a game that I get really excited about, I always think, oh, I hope that they're able to live up to the, the, the promise of the game. Uh, so uh, they said, uh, and I'm, I'm just going to go through their hopes because they're really good. The first one, uh, the box edges should match the other games. They will. They will. That's ab- we're absolutely going to do that. We are absolutely going to gonna have the box match and look and feel. Um, and then their second hope, and I'll, I'll, actually, I'll talk a little bit more about box art soon. Um, and then uh, they write that uh, the game feels a little bit like Unfathomable. Uh, I hope it captures this unique feeling, um, the kind of th- the feeling that Unfathomable gives. Uh, me too. I like. I always design in a reactive footing. I always want to make a better version of something, and I. Um, I think that uh, I think that 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 is something that we are going to be trained trained on. Now, this next one is super interesting. So at various points in the game, I've talked about the fluidity of trader roles in the design. And for a long time, we wanted the game to say, you could become a trader, get caught, and then become a trader again or reform yourself. And I don't know if that's going to be possible in the game. So that is like a hope that I had for a long time. But as we worked on the game, we found that the game's arc was not big enough. It was not long enough for players to have meaningful redemption arcs within the game. Now, I still think there are some ways that we can put that feeling in the design, but probably not as explicitly as letting players freely change their roles. It just makes it a little bit too easy for for bad actors to sort of like pivot between positions. And so much of this game is so focused. It's really so like narrowly trained on a specific moment of time. I don't... I don't want to take away from that from that moment. Um, yes, and then uh, the fourth hope, uh, hoping the game has good a good tense finish. I agree. Needs a good third act. Uh, one of the hardest problems with uh, hidden trader games is that they can peter out in the end uh, in terms of their narrative shape. And so far, I have felt like the ends of the games have been pretty exciting, but I also think this is one of the places in the design where we are still working. We are still doing, you know, you know one way of thinking about it is uh, every three games of Molly House I play, the ending, it fizzles a bit. And so part of the work of the next four or five months is going to be, let's get that batting average up as high as we can get it. Let's make sure it's always ending high. These are things, by the way, that led to... Um, Rule, uh, rules adjustments like doubling points from the last dominance check in in, uh, in Premier, or in the case of John Company, so much of the uh, tuning around firm scoring was was dialed into a desire to make the third act of the story resonant and interesting. But I think it's 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 hard. Um, okay, excellent. Uh, and then uh, someone had uh, a little suggestion. I, I should I should be typing as I'm talking because I could be responding to these threads. Instead, I'll do it later, I guess. Um, someone was like, "Please make the game easier to pack." It will be. It will be. It'll be uh, about as easy, probably easier to pack than uh, Premier. 
Uh, certainly not as complex to pack as this John Company. John Company, from a packing perspective, if you sleeve, is a little bit of a high wire act. Uh, you just have to be very careful. It all fits, and there's a few different ways to do it. But um, we really, really, really did not want to make the box thicker because it was, you know, we have like, we, we want a, the, a person to be able to hold a John Company box in their hand, one handed. And, you know, my hand could hold a thicker box, and but other people's might not be able to. And it just started, it started getting us into a funny spot where I just didn't want the box to be gigantic. If you don't sleeve your copy of John Company, um, it, it all should fit in, in a, any number of ways. Um, and that's, you know, that's how mine is. And I, it, it's always, it's always a tricky balance. I mean, I think it's funny. Someone asked me if I was like, if I sleeve my games and I have always, I have a weird feeling about sleeves because most of the games that I play, I play with sleeves because they're prototypes and I'm, we usually sleeve those. In fact, I spent this afternoon playing arcs uh, here in studios. It was all sleeve cards, but that gives, that actually makes me associate sleeving with like an unfinished game. Uh, and I know that that is just my own weird hang up. Generally, I do not sleeve games unless I've played them so much that the cards begin to fall apart. So my like old war frog edition of brass, the cards were like disintegrating. And so those got sleeved. Um, I think uh, like, Arkham I have sleeved because you shuffle those cards a lot. I don't know. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. And we really do try to accommodate it as best we can. But the every solution is a balancing act between competing interests. Um, excellent. Okay, great, great. Oh, that's good. So th those are just some of the questions and comments I wanted to get into. Um, what I want to do is just talk a little bit about, um, I mean, I'll show you some of the back end and, and what we're working on here. So uh, let's come over here, and we won't go too long. I'll be around for the next next ten, next fifteen minutes. Uh, we'll go to five, maybe. We'll we'll see. We'll just, we'll see we'll see what the spirit is. I'm happy to answer questions. Um, okay, so bup, 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 let me uh, get into the Molly House files. So here's a funny thing. I'll, I'm going to really kind of ex expose our our file structure here. Oh boy. Um, so Molly House files uh, are, they're a real mess. Um, and uh, they, as I mentioned earlier, so here they are. Blah, uh, most of the Molly House files live inside a folder called Historicon 2022, which was just because we were working on the game to get it ready for showing at the, uh, at Historicon, uh, which I think we did digitally. No, wait. Oh my gosh. I can't even remember. We went, Drew and I were at Historicon. I guess we had Molly House with us. That seems crazy. Is that true? I don't know. It's, it seems it's, it's too far, far away. Um, and then, uh, you know, we'll start with the rules here. So here we go with the rules file. We'll kick into uh, an in, in, in design. So here's the rules file. Um, you know, when you're working on a, uh, a game, usually most of the rules work that I do is going to be in uh, a Google Doc. And then right before the launch, I kind of freeze the Google Doc. I say, stop working on the Google Doc. And I typeset the rules. So here's, you know, the Molly House spread. I know that we're going to have a two-page component spread. I actually, I copied over. This is the Premier component spread. And I just copied it over because I wanted to kind of like see how it blocked out on the page. Um, and then uh, we're actually moving to a different, a different type for this game, I think. So all of our games so far are set in a really lovely cut of Baskerville I like. Actually, Root's set in it too. But Baskerville is like not quite right for this game. I think there are two reasons for it. One of them is aesthetic and one's historical. Uh, aesthetic, uh, the historical reason is I, I associate it too much with the state and also with later 18th century. Uh, so we're, uh, we're using Castlon here, uh, which is uh, a really... It's a lovely type. Um, it's one of my favorites, really. And it, um, it, it's a little earlier, which is nice. But also, I just think it has wonderful letter forms, especially you get, like, really fun italics. Um, and this cut has, like, some really good uh, literature, discretionary li literatures and some alternate glyphs. Look at this. We could just... Well, that's not that, that's nothing. But there's a lot of fun stuff that can be done with with, with this uh, with this type. Uh, good kerning. It's yeah. It's it's a lovely it's a lovely time. 
Um, and so I, I actually, I really like working in, in Castellan. I used to work in it a bunch. Uh, and, and I think this cut, which is LTC Castellan, which is, um, it's the one in the Adobe suite, is really good. It like, it composes, uh, it composes great. Um, so here we go, here are our spreads. So uh, one funny thing about this, you know, when you're working on a rule book, uh, there's like a way, I mean, at least at this point, we have a house style. So I look at the Premier rulebook and I say, these, I think the Premier rulebook is good. I think the John Company rulebook is good. It's hard to take lessons from the John Company rulebook because it's longer and the game is more complex. So like people will say like, oh, the John Company rules. I had all these questions. And I'm like, yeah, you're learning a hard game. Like, it's like someone saying, I went on like a long race. It was long. So I'm, you know, I don't, I think that, I think that the, the, the quality of those rulebooks, I think to my eye, just as, you know, as a professional is very similar. And I think John Company is a much bigger, more complex game. Uh, but the P Premier book rule book, I'm really happy with. Uh, we get hardly any questions about it. Uh, there's like a, there were a couple points of ambiguity we fixed, in, fixed I think, in the second printing, but it's really in great shape. So um, when I was laying out these rules, I was like, okay, so we got a component spread. We've got the Molly House rules here. We've got a lovely little component spread. Then we'll do have a setup spread here. And then we get key concepts, which is just, you know, whoops. Uh, don't want to screw up this file. Key concepts is, are like kind of high level overview things. Um, you know, like table talk. Here's what victory is. Here's what your player area is. And then we go into the kind of general rules. Now there's a funny, um, there's a key concepts and general rules aren't really different things, but I like to find ways to make the rules a little bit more digestible. And so the notion that like here, we're going to talk about vice cards and how they work. And here's like how cards get revealed and here's how cards get, uh, drawn and then uh constables um and i always think about general rules are rules that you're going to like key concepts are really like almost terms and definitions but i don't like making it a terms and definitions section because you're gonna end up with what happens with war games where you have to go through a two-page glossary at the start not a bad thing in war gaming it's actually a great thing but it doesn't really fit here general rules are rules that are going to be invoked by a number of different actions. So like resolving a constable can happen in lots of different parts of the game. And so I want to put all those rules in one place. Now, when I was working with Josh on Root, I think it was a learn to play. Um, that was the place where I think, I think in, in the course of working with Josh, it's been interesting because I think he and I uh, at Leader, when we, when we start, he, he's been working as an editor much longer than I had been working as an editor. But we had a very similar, I think, philosophy and attitude about word choice and rule structure that did not care about layout so much. And the longer I've worked in this industry, the more I find myself caring about layout. And so when we were working on the learn to plays in uh, Root, and then especially the, 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 the playbook of, um, or the, the, I can't remember what it's called, but, but the like player's handbook uh, in Oath, we started spending a lot of time talking and thinking about spreads. And so here we have a spread here. And you can actually, you can see some of this work. I mean, I actually think one of the most interesting projects I've ever worked on, which I don't talk about very much, is Vast the Mysterious Manor. Because in that project, you can see us applying lessons from root to another project. And so you get a lot of that like spread thinking happening. So here's the general rule spread. So I want, I want you know, I basically want most of the constable rules on one page and then the arrest and guilt tokens, informers, and accusing a player, they get to sit in the page too. Now, looking at this, the, the page size that I use is a little bit, I mean, if this is a U.S. letter piece up here, I'll actually, let me turn my camera on here in a better way. Whoop. So here's a, this is a U.S. letter piece. You'll note that the, the margin is like actually here. The rule books, I use this kind of like slightly smaller page size. It doesn't correspond to really any page size that exists, but I like it a lot because it feels very natural to hold and it forces me to not put too many words on a page, uh, which is good. So uh, here we have this, and then we have the mollies kind of floating up on this section, and then we get the sequence of play here. Uh, then we open into the actual structure of the game. Here's the week. This is almost all the actions of the game in one place right here. Uh, you'll see, you know, take the thief taker's office, take one of the top two cards from the discard pile and add it to your revealed area. Uh, there should be a comma there. Boop. Uh, is it the imperative. Uh, then draw one card and add it to the discard pile. Finally, regardless of whether or not you drew a constable, add any revealed cards to your hand. So that's that's the thief taker's office. Pretty simple action. Uh, and what one can imagine this spread getting doubled and then having lots of examples. That that could certainly happen. 
Um, and then uh, the Molly House action is a page and a half. Now, again, this is almost certainly going to get blown out into, into a full spread. But, and, and this is where, where uh, typography and layout and graphic design and game design all and rules editing all exist in the same place. Because guess what? I don't want the Molly House action to be more than two pages. So if the design starts asking for features and elements, I'm going to start finding ways of reconceptualizing this action just so we can get it to fit on one spread because a single action that takes more than one spread is asking for problems. So then we have reputation scoring. That's very easy. Gossip phase, also fairly straightforward. Clean up, basically a small to-do list. And then we get to the, uh, to the game end and file scoring here and some credits and things like that. So these rules are very uh, close to being shareable. In fact, I noticed an error in them. Uh, what was it? Yes. So I noticed this yesterday when I was looking it up. Um, so they need, if they choose guilt tokens, they must draw one token for each matching card. Yeah, so I had, I had to add this because it just said for each card, and it's like, no, it's every matching card. Um, and the matching card is the constable, right? Uh, let me make sure that's, that's clear here. Uh, I'm just checking this. Look at this. We're doing work together here. Um, I think it's, it's, it's roughly, there, there's some language stuff that needs to be, that needs to be cleaned up here, but it, it's pretty close. So I actually got these rules in a spot where I feel pretty comfortable exporting them. Whoops. So what I'm going to do right now, live on stream is export a file, uh, because these are all going to be shared with you tomorrow, tomorrow morning, probably. Um, and we, uh, so I'm just going to put them in my downloads, rules, Molly House Kickstarter, cool, I'll replace the old cut that I did, high quality print, let's go, make it look nice, um, and we're going to let that, that, export, that export roll. So what we'll do here is while this export is ticking down, I'm going to, in our Molly House, in, I think best place to put this. So usually when we share Kickstarter rules, I like to put them in Google Drive because Google Drive, I love Dropbox, love it, but Google Drive is better comments, better comment system than Google Drive. Uh, and the, the a Kickstarter is a great place where people are looking at things. And so I want to be getting good comments. Um, now uh, I'll say, I'll say a quick word about schedule. Um, Y'all can comment as much as you want. I will not be able to really get to the comments until um, until after after the end of the weekend. Um, okay, so let's make a folder, new folder. Oh no, this is the wrong wrong Google Drive. We're working together. All right, there's this, there's this. Excellent, cool. Um, I'm gonna make a new folder for Molly House. Uh, and what we're going to do is I'm going to now upload our lovely uh, rules document that I just exported right into there. And I will, I will, you will be able to share, you'll be able to, to, to use this link. Actually, I'm going to change the title of the link to include the date. What is it? And I, uh, so now, um, basically, there will be a folder uh, that I will be providing you all with uh, a link to tomorrow. And uh, it will give you access to this rules document. And you can print it and read it yourself and all those things. Um, and you'll be able to yeah, enjoy, enjoy, enjoy these rules. Uh, they're, they're pretty fun. And then, uh, and then if a few days later, next, uh, next week, we will have uh, kits, playtesting kits. Currently planning on doing them in Screentop, which you already saw if you watched the stream, uh, Tabletop Simulator, and then 
Lastly, I think we are going to be making a physical kit, which I had planned on making with you all today, but I think I'll probably end up doing it tonight because it, it's boring. You're going to watch me like place cards into frames and then label the pages and talk a little bit about making a kit. That's boring. You don't need to worry about, <laughs> worry about that stuff. Um, okay, great. Uh, well, let's see here. We've got, oh my gosh, a lot of folks in the chat. Um, Excellent. Let's go here and here. So uh, with that, I hope that gives you a little sense of, of what's going on. I wanted to say uh, two th quick things. So first, to talk about the design itself. So um, we are now in an interesting spot because running the, this back kit is very busy. Uh, it requires a lot of work. Uh, so we're in a busy time. We're not able to do like a ton of development right now. Um, we'll be able to restart development in a, in a couple weeks, in a few weeks. Um, while this is going on, though, we are paying attention to plays and to the moments where things, par certain parts of the games aren't working. And, and Malias is, is a very funny game. It's very, um, working on simpler games, is very fra it's very fragile business. So, for example, right now, um, probably constables cause players to lose too many actions. I'll just say that as a statement in the design. Um, and so it can be frustrating as a, a, a player just over and over again. You get slammed with, with guilt tokens and things like that. And there are very fine-tuned adjustments that we're going to be making to just kind of build that space out a little bit. Um, and that, that's a major area where, we are, where we're looking. Uh, we're also going to be spending a lot of time making sure the uh, tension of the festivities is right. Um, we had a lovely moment happen where, where Drew and I, um, we, we had been stewing with Joe on an idea of like playing cards back into your hand. And this is coming from us playing a lot of Condottier. And so we, we love Scarecrows and getting cards back in. And I thought, ooh, this is really neat. I like a lot of this stuff. I wonder if we can bring some of this energy to Molly House. And almost within a few days, Ricky, who's working on a solo game, said, oh, what if you had Jokers that did the same thing? And I thought, we're on the same page. This is a good sign. This is a good sign. Um, and then, uh, you know, beyond that, of course, there's a lot of work to be done on some of the content development and on the solo design. In my, in my opinion, um, I think that the primary development of this game is probably going to take about two to three months. We have budgeted four to five in the actual project. Um, but I think that, you know, we, we're, we are well on the way. I mean, I, we're two years into this project and we're, we're really just a few months away and it has it has so dramatically taken its shape over the past, um, over really just the past few months. Um, the version that you're all seeing here really kind of leapt into being in uh, June of this last year. And then we worked on it over the summer. And then there was another really intensive uh, design period in late August and early September. And by the time we got all that sorted out, we, were like, we thought, yep, we feel really great about this. And in fact, it was funny, we, we sent uh, Dan a preview kit um, and that weekend, we finished a battery of changes that we folded into the rules that really dramatically corrected a few, a few very small elements. But it was an instance where like, the game hardly changed, but it was like one very important, important rule. Um, so yeah, we, we, you know, we're, we're, we're in a great place with this design. I cannot wait for you all to play it. It's just, like, it's just an interesting, silly, wonderful thing. Um, and I, I found it... Um, to be one of my favorite games to teach and play with people, which is always a good sign. I think that there's almost no better way to know how, how you really feel about something you're working on than when you have to demo it with someone or show someone because your, your stomach knots and everything. But with this game, I, I end up feeling quite charged up. Um, great. Uh, so the last thing I'll say is uh, my, uh, my, myself and Drew are going to be uh, away for a couple days. Um, we're just, we have a little trip we're going on. Uh, and so we won't be quite as active in the comments over the next couple of days. Um, and I know that this is slightly oddly timed with the release of the rules, but we really wanted to get the rules to you all. Uh, we will try to keep an eye on everything, and then you'll be seeing a lot more of us uh, later this weekend on, on Sunday and Monday. Um, and then we'll be back at it. We've got lots of fun events coming up on the, on the, the schedule, which I'm, which I'm thrilled by. Uh, let me actually take a look at that schedule right now so I don't speak out of turn. This is how you get to websites. I'm doing it. Um, the next thing that we will be having on the schedule is we have the rule book, which comes out tomorrow. Hooray. Uh, after that, on the 23rd, uh, Drew will be doing a full playthrough stream, which um, I, can't, I don't know precisely who was on that stream offhand. 
Uh, but they'll be doing a full game. Uh, it's going to be great. I'm really excited to, to watch them do everything. Hopefully, you'll be able to see the full arc of the game. Um, then on the uh, 24th, the next day, we'll be releasing the playtesting kits. And so that way, when the playtesting kit comes out, you will have the rules document, the introductory video, this video, and a full playthrough to, to reference. Uh, and then on the 28th, we have an art stream with Rachel, <laughs> which I'm, I'm actually I'm really looking forward to. And then, of course, we have the, the, uh, the reading Molly House uh, session with Joe and Dr. Cat to wound, uh, wind out, wind down the campaign. Um, however you want to say it. Anyway, uh, I think that's pretty much it. Are there any final questions from the chat? Anything you'd like me to answer while you have me? You've got a couple minutes. I'll, I'll, take, I'll take any questions you got. All right, excellent. So while that happens, I will... Where does the complexity sit? Uh, you could, uh, we talked about this a little bit earlier. I love that this is actually, uh, we never knew what people, we did not know what people were going to ask us uh, in, in this, um, ask us about Molly House, but the complexity question I think is great. I think on the BGG scale, let's call it a, let's call it a three, a three one. Uh, in practice, I think this game takes about 15 minutes to teach. Um, and your first game is probably going to be two hours long. And then it comes down to like basically 90 minutes or an hour, like pretty fast. Um, most of the actions in this game, very simple, very quickly. That being said, there's a lot of depth to this game. There's a lot to think about. However, there's, there's a double qualifier. So, you know, I'm in, I'm in tricky waters here. Um, it's also a game that uh, deals with uncertainty. And so I think some players might look at it and be like, oh, this game seems random. There's not a lot going on in the hood. And I'm like, well, you know, there is actually, there is a lot happening under the, under the hood. It's just sometimes you do lose a turn. <laughs> um, and that's just how the game works. Uh, yeah, great, great question. Very happy to have that. Uh, all right. Well, uh, thank you all for tuning in th this evening. I, uh, again, I'll just express my thanks for myself and Drew and Joe and, Rachel and Ricky and everyone else who's helping us on this project. Um, I, uh, I am just so grateful. And I'm also, I, I, we didn't know what it would be like to, um, to, to publish a game on this subject. And it has been so wonderful to see so many of you come out to support it. And we are so excited to bring you Molly House and all the projects that we are, uh, we are cooking up coming up after this. All right. Well, with that, we will, we will call it a stream and I will see you all uh, for the rules release tomorrow and we'll see you on a stream later on in the campaign.